Good evening, and welcome to the William G. McGowan Theater here at the National Archives for tonight's discussion on medics, corpsmen, and nurses in Vietnam, presented in partnership with the National Library of Medicine. I'm David Ferriero, the Archivist of the United States, and I'm pleased that you can be with us, whether you're here in the William G. McGowan Theater or joining us on our YouTube station. We are honored to have such a distinguished panel tonight, Dr. Dale Smith, Professor of Military Medicine and History at the Uniformed Services University of the, of the Health Sciences, who will moderate the discussion. Retired General Merle Snyder, who served in Vietnam with the 45th Medical Company as a dust-off helicopter pilot. Retired Major General Donna Barbish, who served in Vietnam as an Army nurse at the 91st Avac Hospital. Dr. Tom Berger, who served in Vietnam as a hospital corpsman with the 3rd Marine Division, 3rd Recon Battalion, and retired Colonel Donald Hall, a veteran of both the Gulf War in Iraq and a medical support historian. Tonight's discussion is part of a series of discussions, films, programs, lectures, and other events related to the Remembering Vietnam exhibit upstairs in the Lawrence F. O'Brien Gallery. I hope you'll be able to return on Tuesday, May 1st at noon for a program that will commemorate the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Marines' victory at the Battle of Daido. Between April 30th and May 2nd, 1968, U.S. Marines of the 2nd Battalion, 4th Regiment, known as the Magnificent Bastards, engaged the North Vietnamese Army at Daido. Outnumbered three to one, the Marines ultimately prevailed in one of the most significant victories of the war. Retired Brigadier General William Wild Bill Weiss, commander of the battalion, will moderate a discussion with veterans of that conflict. To learn more about these and all of our public programs and exhibits, consult our monthly calendar of events online at archives.gov, and check out our website and sign up at the table outside the theater to get email updates. You'll also find information about other National Archives programs and exhibits. And another way to get more involved with the National Archives is to become a member of the National Archives Foundation. The foundation supports all of the work of our agency in terms of education and outreach activities, and there are applications for membership in the lobby. Now I ask all Vietnam veterans or any United States, United States veteran who served on active duty in the United States Armed Forces at any time during the period, November 1st, 1955, to May 15th, 1975, to stand and be recognized. Veterans, as you exit the McGowan Theater after tonight's program, National Archives staff and volunteers will present each of you with the Vietnam veteran lapel pin. On the back of the pin is embossed, a grateful nation thanks and honors you. The United States of America Vietnam War Commemoration is a national initiative, and the lapel pin is the nation's lasting memento of thanks. As I mentioned earlier, this program is related to our special exhibit, Remembering Vietnam. For this exhibit, our curatorial staff combed through National Archives records here and across the country to find the documents that tell the stories recounted in the 12 episodes of this exhibit. These records came in many forms, typed reports, photographs, audio recordings, motion picture film, and video videotapes and artifacts. Remembering Vietnam traces the long arc of the war from the decisions that led to increased American involvement to the eventual withdrawal of U.S. troops. But it also brings us face to face with individual stories of the people who lived, fought, and died in Vietnam. Often when we hear tales of war, the narrator will conclude with the end of the battle. But for the wounded soldiers, sailors, and Marines, their stories are not over, but beginning a new chapter of treatment and recovery. And the medics, corpsmen, and nurses who tend to them where they fall, or in field hospitals, or aboard, aboard hospital ships, guide them through this next, often uncertain, phase. As I mentioned earlier, our partner in tonight's program is the National Library of Medicine, and I would like to thank them, thank all of them for their assistance in putting together this discussion. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Jerry Sheehan, Deputy Director of the National Library of Medicine, where he shares responsibility with the Director for overall program development, 
evaluation, policy formulation, direction, and coordination of all the library's activities. Please welcome Jerry Sheehan. Well, good evening. I'm very pleased uh, to be able to be here with you tonight. I'm honored to be able to represent the National Library of Medicine at tonight's event. I want to thank the archivist David Ferriero and his team at NARA for inviting us, the National Library of Medicine, to be part of the proceedings tonight and to take part in this uh, event that, we're, uh, that we'll, we'll proceed with uh, now. Uh, for us, the National Library of Medicine, this is really an opportunity for us to take from some of our own collections, some of our items, and put them in a context in which they can be better appreciated, better recognized and interpreted, and help us to recognize uh, those corpsmen, medics, nurses, and others who so ably served in the, in the Vietnam War era. For those who are not familiar with the National Library of Medicine, let me just say a word. We are one of 27 institutes and centers that comprise the National Institutes of Health located up in Bethesda, Maryland. And like most of those other research centers there, we also fund and conduct research that tries to improve health and medicine and medical practice. For us, our work is centered largely around computing communications and information technologies. But what we're probably best known for is that we are the world's largest biomedical library. We have a vast collection and growing collection of contemporary and historical materials related to virtually all aspects of, of health and medicine. And it's some of those objects that you'll have an opportunity to see during the proceedings uh, today. We also, because we've moved most of this into an online format, we have millions of people who visit us virtually every day, as well as a few who come in in person every day. And I hope at some point you might come to NLM yourselves in person would be preferred, but come online as well to take advantage of the resources that we have available. NLM also has, in keeping with the theme of tonight's uh, event, we also have a strong, close ties to the military. The National Library of Medicine traces its roots back to 1836 when we were the library of the Surgeon General of the US Army. We started as a small collection of books that grew quite, uh, quite quickly over time. By 1922, we were the US Army's medical library. And for a short period of time in the early 1950s, we were the Armed Services Medical Library. In the 1956, we became part of the Public Health Service and were called the National Library of Medicine. But to this day, we have strong ties to, to the military. We have on our Board of Regents, our governing board, representatives uh, of the Surgeon Generals of all of the, the major services, as well as the US Surgeon General. We also have a representative who you'll meet later tonight uh, from the Uniform Services University of Health Sciences, Mr. Dr. Dale Smith, who will be the moderator for today's event, who not only conducts historical research in our uh, institution, but has also provided sage sound advice to the director and to me as the deputy director of NLM for, for many years. So you can imagine the great enthusiasm with which we uh, embrace this opportunity to collaborate with our, our colleagues at NARA to help put together this program. Uh, we worked with them to identify the speakers, identify some of the themes, and put them in context. And in fact, you might have seen that we've published interviews already with each of the, the speakers. I think maybe there's still one more to come, if I understand right. And those have been included in our Circulating Now blog, which I think has 5,000 subscribers and more than 300,000 followers. So this, this has an opportunity to reach a much broader audience. I want to take a moment to thank several members of the NLM staff, Ginny Roth, Doug Aitkins and Sarah Ehlers, uh, who assisted, they're from our imaging and archive section, who helped in researching and identifying the images and videos that you'll see tonight, and who helped contextualize the memorable stories that you're going to hear from the panelists tonight in their blog posts. I also want to recognize Dr. Jeffrey Resnick, the chief of our History of Medicine Division, and his deputy, seated next to him here, Ken Coyle, who have led our, our, our uh, efforts in the History of Medicine Division and our collaboration with NARA tonight. I also just want to say that from a personal perspective, I also have an interest, a deep interest into tonight's proceedings. I was not a medic, a corpsman, or a nurse in the US military, nor did I, nor did I participate in the, in the Vietnam conflict. But I have a father-in-law who did, and who, during his two tours of duty in Vietnam, one very early in the uh, US engagement and one very, uh, very near the end, he uh, received 
two of his four Purple Hearts for, the, for injuries sustained during those engagements. And I know during those uh, instances and probably others, he was also uh, benefited from the great care, the dedication, and the skill of the medics, the corpsmen, and the nurses like those that we're gonna, we're gonna have here with us tonight. And I'm sure this will be an opportunity for us tonight to really have an evening full of these kinds of memories, reflections, and history from that era. And I wanna let you have an opportunity to hear from them uh, tonight and our, our panelists. So let me finish simply by thanking again archivist David Ferriero and his team here at NARA for inviting us to be part of this event. Thank you to you who are here in the audience with us and as well who are watching us remotely for letting us be part of uh, your experience this evening. I hope you enjoy the program, and I do hope that I might see some of you out at the National Library of Medicine sometime too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. And now it's my pleasure to um, ask you to welcome to tonight's moderator, Dr. Dale Smith, and our distinguished panel to the stage. Thank you, and I'll add my welcome. We, uh, we have a small film clip that I think we'd like to use to set the stage as we introduce the panel and introduce their experiences to you and begin a conversation that I hope before the night is over will involve all of us. All right, we'll assume it's conserved, but not ready. <laughs> Absolutely unprecedented. Looks like it's coming. For a soldier, the war is over, at least for a little while, the moment he is wounded. How soon he returns to the fight depends on how quickly he receives help and the kind of help he gets. In Vietnam, where ambulances come out of the sky, a wounded man is never far from a hospital and has the best in medical care all the way. Dust off 7-4, dispatch you 6-5, Bill. That's dust off 7-4, we're approaching your area from the north at this time. Pop your smoke at this time, what's your recommended approach into the area and what is your security? Uh, Roger, we are popping smoke at this time. Recommended direction of approach is from north to south. Tactical situation in the area is secure. That's dust off 7-4, understand approach from north to south. I have green smoke. Uh, Roger, that's affirmative, we have green smoke and your direction of approach is affirmative. That's dust off 7 4. I'm on final approach at this time. Let him down. All right, we have someone out there to guide you in. 7 4. Okay, lock and load. We're on final approach at this time. Pick up the hedge rolls on the left and right. Area is secure. So we'll go in as attack security is not secure. Pick up hedge rolls left and right. Final approach. When an air ambulance is called in by the medic at the casualty site, it comes with enough equipment to provide immediate first aid, resuscitation, and stabilization. Litters and blankets, splint sets, tourniquets and dressings, an airway tube, dextran and morphine are all on board. A portable resuscitator is also available to the aid man.
in some ways, that is the iconic change in Vietnam medical care. Yes, everybody's seen MASH, and there were helicopters in Korea, but they didn't go to the point of wounding. They, they went to a casualty aid station. And so the history of how that happened becomes an important part of our heritage. We're going to ask our first panelist, retired Colonel Donald Hall, to talk a little about how that changed. Colonel Hall is a trained historian. He's also a professional engineer. He uh, has served as a uh, hospital planner and medical support specialist, uh, military plans and intelligence for the Army. Uh, in fact, he's still exploring what he's going to do when he grows up. <laughs> but uh, tonight, he's going to share with us some of his historical research on the nature of medicine in Vietnam. Colonel Hall. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, I've been researching now for about a year and a half on the history of our, history primarily of Army medicine, the war in Vietnam. Um, one of the things that becomes very clear is that there, there were significant changes in the way casualties were treated and evacuated in Vietnam. Um, from the Civil War until actually till today, our evacuation system has, has, has been the same. Patients were, from the point of injury, were evacuated from point to point with the higher echelon going forward, bringing the patient back to the next level of treatment, um, primarily by ground. That meant in World War II, someone who got injured would take, on average, 10 hours to get to the first hospital. In Korea, that was cut down to, on average, five hours. In Vietnam, it was less than an hour. Um, in World War II, once you got to a hospital, your survival rate was 95.5%. So if you got to the hospital, you had about a 95% chance of survival. In Vietnam, that was increased to 97.5%. At the same time, though, the patients who were getting to those hospitals were more severely injured because patients who were dying en route because of that 10-hour evacuation time were surviving to get to the hospital. So let's talk about how that happened. Let's talk about the event first of, excuse me, February 26, 1962. February 26, 1962 is an important date in Vietnam, in the Vietnam War's history, because that is a date that the first five Hueys showed up in Vietnam. Oh, that's a picture of my research equipment. That's a picture of me. <laughs> uh, we'll talk about this guy in a second. He's the guy my niece calls the man with the helicopter. <laughs> um, on February 26, 1962, the first Huey sh five Hueys showed up in Vietnam. I don't mean the first five dust-offs, the first five medical evacuation Hueys. I mean the first five Hueys, period, end of statement. And they belonged to the 57th Medical Detachment Air Ambulance out of Fort Meade, uh, Maryland. The Huey was designed as a medical evacuation aircraft. That's how come it fit three or six litters perfectly, but you couldn't fit an infantry squad in it. It was designed to correct the deficiencies of the helicopters in Korea, which would provide in route care. That was the difference between Korea and Vietnam. You could put a medic in the aircraft to care for the patient in route. That changed things significantly. So Major John Temporelli brought the 57th over. They had a lot of problems at first for two reasons. One, when you got the only five Hueys in country, you got a problem with spare parts. The second thing is when you've got the five most capable aircraft in country, everybody's eyeing your aircraft. You know, you're not picking up a lot of casualties because there aren't a lot of casualties. There aren't a lot of U.S. personnel in country at the time. Do you really need those aircraft? You're not flying a lot of missions. Why don't you give them to us? We'll take the Red Crosses off. Just put them on when you need them. You know? In fact, at one point, they grounded all his aircraft because of spare parts. He tried to take them away. Temporarily fought that fight. He was replaced by Major Lloyd Spencer, who continued the fight. Again, same thing. Uh, you don't have enough Medical Service Corps pilots. Um, you don't have enough warrant officer pilots. Why don't we put some infantry officers in there to fly them aircraft for you? Then, on 1 January 1964, this man, Major Charles Kelly, assumes command of the 57th Medical Detachment. 
Most of you probably never heard of him, but I guarantee you that he probably saved a couple of your lives. You may not know it, you may not have heard of him, but I guarantee you that he had an effect on you. He assumed command on 1 July 1964, and he immediately implemented changes in the unit. He said, we're going to go look for work. And he started flying. He told his men, you're going to fly. His motto, or his, his rule was, no excuse, no hesitation, fly the mission, fly it now. And he accepted every mission he could. He flew, at some points, up to 160 hours a month. To put that in perspective, that's like working a 40-hour week every week in a month. So you can imagine spending an entire work week in the cockpit, in the air. And his men did it too. His men loved him. Higher headquarters hated him. Why? Because he'd pick fights with them. I've read his OERs. They said things like he fights for his men, he fights for his aircraft. Every month, though, the number of missions went up because he said, we'll take anybody, we'll pick up Vietnamese, we'll pick up wounded Viet Cong, we don't care. It's our mission. Kelly had been wounded as an enlisted man in World War II, so he knew the significance of picking up men. Um, in April, in, in, uh, April, May, and June, he won four distinguished flying crosses and a silver star. Then came 1 July 1964 perhaps the most important date for Army medicine in the entire war. Kelly was called on a medical evacuation mission. He took off in his aircraft, typical crew, came into a hot LZ, he got fired upon. He circled around, got fired upon again, couldn't get into the LZ. The guys on the ground said, don't come in, don't come in, it's too hot. Kelly wasn't going to put up with that, because that's the kind of man Kelly was. He tried to get in again. Couldn't get in. Tried to get in again. They said, don't do it. Just go away. Kelly said, I'll leave when I have your wounded aboard. At least that's what his, uh, the report of the story said. It was written by a young journalist called Peter Arnett. You might have heard of him. He won a Pulitzer Prize. Later became a big wig on CNN because he happened to be in uh, Baghdad on TV. Um, anyway, right after he said that, Kelly took a round of the chest. Um, it's about 30 feet off the ground, high hover, rolled the aircraft over, beat itself to death on the, beat the aircraft to pieces on the ground, and he died instantly. Um, so the next day, the, uh, the acting commander of the 57th for that day, actually the operations officer, a guy named Captain Pat Brady, was called in by their higher headquarters. The commander tossed the bullet that killed Kelly, at Brady and said, I suppose you're going to do things different now, aren't you? Brady said, no, sir, we're going to do things exactly the same way, the way Kelly taught us to. Now, Kelly had a, the 57th had a call sign, but it became so associated with Kelly that he was known as the man who was dust off. And they adopted his call sign, his, his call sign, essentially, for every mission, and still used today. If you call for a medevac, you don't call for a medevac, you call for a dust-off, because Kelly was a man who was dust-off. And I would argue with you that those five words, when I have your wounded, became a challenge to dust-off pilots. They became a mission for medevac units, and they sealed the fight over whether medevac units would belong to medics or aviation or transportation. And it was, a, it was a fight that Kelly won for 50 years. And it was dust off that allowed us to put hospitals in fixed facilities in Vietnam. It was dust off that allowed us to get patients to the hospitals in 30 minutes. It was dust off that allowed us to set up specialty centers in the hospitals. It was dust off that allowed us to move 850,000 patients during the war. And that, I would maintain, is the most important thing, and that those five words were the most important words that were uttered in the entire Vietnam War. And with that, I will pass it on to the next comrade. Well, thank you. Um, my name is uh, Tom Berger. Um, I'm really glad to be here tonight, and uh, for a couple of reasons. It was 50 years ago uh, this week 
that I was wounded for the last time and medevaced out of Vietnam. In, uh, in <coughs> the spring of 68 from a place called Khe Son. But before I get there, um, this is a very distinguished group of colleagues I'm with here. I want to thank the people from the archives and the library systems and what have you for uh, putting this on tonight. Um, it re is really important. Uh, I was a, an enlisted man. And it's really important to have kinds of, these kinds of things for the veterans out there who have never been thanked for their service in Vietnam. And so it's really important that we have these kinds of things. So anyway, I was a Navy corpsman um, attached to the United States Marines. Uh, drafted originally into the Army, but at that time in 1965, you could still join another branch of the service. So I called my father, who was a Pacific Marine, wounded at Tarawa. I said, Pop, what do I do? I get my draft notice. He said, I don't want you joining the Army. And Marines are already over there. I had an uncle, my dad's brother-in-law, who'd been over there as an advisor, because we had a map in the dining room, and we had a pin, or pins in it, wherever Uncle Jerry was serving in Vietnam. Anyway, so I joined the Navy. And I signed up to be a Navy corpsman. Well, until I got home, I really didn't know what Navy corpsman did. I had thought, because I'd run into a high school classmate uh, at the re where I, where I uh, enlisted, who just served for a couple of years down at Memphis Naval Air Station. I thought, hey, that's great duty. So John and I renewed our acquaintance, and he said, uh, you ought to think about being a corpsman. What was your major in college? I said, pre-med. He said, oh, that's great. So I joined, and I went home and told my father, and I thought, uh-oh, I got a problem here, because my father explained to me what Navy corpsmen also do besides serve in hospitals and on hospital ships. They serve with Marine combat units. So. Uh, to make a long story short, after boot camp and um, corpsman school at Great Lakes uh, in Illinois, and I started boot camp in February, which uh, at that time they still had the wooden barracks. And it was pretty nippy at night uh, with the wind blowing off Lake Michigan. In any case, uh, after finishing corps school, I then went uh, to Camp Lejeune via Norfolk. Uh, to join the Marines. And uh, at uh, Lejeune, they taught me all about marine life and how to shoot uh, certain kinds of weapons, etc. And then I landed uh, for the first time in country in October of 66. Uh, shortly thereafter, I was wounded for the first time. Um, I got caught in a bunker and some rockets came in. And, um, I really hadn't been exposed to actual combat medicine at that time. I mean, we took wounded at Chulai um, on their way out of country. And so we just kind of, the new guys, like myself, we just kind of stood around and watched the more experienced uh, corpsmen and docs <clears throat> handle things. Uh, so when I came back after a recovery from my first wound, um, I then actually got into the real stuff with a recon unit. Now, uh, if you read the, the blog thing, I, I mentioned a couple of, of terms. Uh, one is a snoop and poop. Uh, this was an operation whereby they take us in uh, sometimes without any identification on the aircraft or on our uniforms. Uh, they'd insert us. That's what they called it. Uh, and we were to try and locate enemy units who were supposedly uh, in the area. We weren't supposed to engage them. Okay, and that's very, very critical because we were a small unit. We had a limited amount of firepower. And then sometimes we couldn't call in close ground uh, air support. But anyway, our job was to see if indeed, if <clears throat> what the intelligence reports were telling us was true that there were units of 
NVA or VC moving around. Well, let me interrupt uh, um, this part of the story and tell you about a, a couple of things. Um, on the uh, snoop and poop, it dawned on me, you know, here we are, a bunch of Americans, you know, we all got grease paint on, and uh, we didn't necessarily carry American weapons. Uh, in any case, I mean, who are you trying to fool? Okay? If we were going to go down in Laos, for example, um, you know, you're thinking of going to fool the Laotians? Okay? An American helicopter, just because it doesn't have any numbers or any ID on it, uh, Americans in uni American uniforms, okay, just because you didn't have, anyway. So, um, I was wounded again in the spring of 67, uh, and this time it was a gunshot wound, what we call, or like, I like to call, uh, through and through. Uh, no bones, all right, just went right through up here in this area of the shoulder. So after recovering from that, I rejoined my unit again. Now, Marine units in Vietnam ser served 13 months, as opposed to Army grunt units, ground, which served 12 months. So I was kind of behind already, and my MOS, Navy Corpsman, uh, we had a pretty high casualty rate. So if you could still walk and chew gum at the same time, okay, they didn't send you home. You were sent back to your unit. So I joined my unit again uh, in the summer of, of 67 when we mo were moved up north uh, in the area of Quezon, which uh, there's been a lot written about Quezon and its importance and whether or not it was um, sort of a, uh, it was the turning point, if you will, um, Johnson said, I understand uh, from various sources, Johnson actually said, I don't want no damn bien, dien bien fu, meaning Khe San, because the French had been uh, kicked out of Vietnam in 1954 at dien bien fu. In any case, so there was a lot of focus on the Marines up there at, uh, at Khe San, and the only way to get to it uh, by road was Highway 9. And a lot of the time, Highway 9 was closed because the enemy would blow it up or parts of it up and that sort of thing. So it wasn't a, a, a good uh, route uh, for supplying. And I'll get, do that, uh, get into that a little bit more as um, I relate some of my experiences up to Quezon. In any case, so the same kind of routine was going on at uh, Quezon. We, Quezon in the uh, late summer and early fall of, of 67, we were a battalion aid station, and we uh, took mostly, mostly uh, LERPs. These are, were uh, guys who would go out in the field disguised as trees and coconut palms and what have you for weeks at a time, live off the land. Um, they're intelligence people. Uh, working with the LERPs and other recon units, we had some SAS, uh, troops uh, up there who were England's special forces, really good jungle fighters, no doubt about it, because they trained in Burma. In any case, or what was Burma at the time. Uh, we also had some, what we called them Kiwis, uh, the New Zealanders, some of their uh, highly trained uh, special forces. We had uh, Republic of South Korea, rocks, as we call them, which were tough as nails. <clears throat> and we had um, South Korea, uh, South uh, Vietnamese uh, troops as well. Tom, I'm going to interrupt you. Sure. Um, I think the important thing we want to remember is that <clears throat> you were there to take care of the wounded. That's right. And that's a job that had been being done since the First World War by Navy corpsmen when they first were sent out from the ambulance unit to the, the hospital. But then we, we moved that wounded in the different way, as, as Colonel Hall said. And I want to get to uh, Colonel Snyder, because he was there in that new role of flying those helicopters 
and taking those wounded from the corpsman who put that first dressing on them and began to manage them back to a place where more care could be given. Yeah. And so uh, after Vietnam, Colonel Snyder stayed in the military at a variety of jobs. But I want him to talk a little bit about what it was like to be trained to take that helicopter into Vietnam and pick up those wounded and take them to the ground ambulance and the hospital where they could receive more care. I, I will say before I turn it over to the colonel here, it changed the face of warfare for the Marine Corps uh, in terms of health care. For the first time, I know we had helicopters in uh, Korea, but not to the extent that they were coordinated with ground units, particularly with uh, aid battalions. And although you just saw a picture of the helicopters that the Marines used initially in Vietnam until we got some Hueys and access to Chinooks and that sort of thing, we used SH-34s, which we called uh, grasshoppers. And that's what we did. It changed the face of health care for the United States Marine Corps and the Navy because we were able to get people out, okay, to larger mass units or field hospitals or even in the case of um, hospital ships uh, flying off the coast of Vietnam. So with that, I'll turn Colonel. it over. Hey, thanks. And uh, I really enjoy the comments of... Uh, Dr. Hall here about my old uh, colleague, Kelly. And uh, as he may mention, when uh, Kelly was killed, the gentleman that took his place, uh, a guy named Pat Brady, was really no slouch. He himself is a Medal of Honor winner for doing this mission as well. So. And he said Kelly was the bravest man he ever knew. Yeah, and, yeah huh? and he was the one that really wow. looked up to Kelly. But anyhow, my road to getting to Vietnam was kind of uh, uh, based upon the Selective Service Committee classified me uh, 1A, <laughs> and knowing I was going to be going real soon, my my uh, I didn't get asked about my major in college. Uh, like I uh, wasn't pre-med. I was mostly uh, girls and beer. So I said, "You better be an aviator." <laughs> so <laughs> that's that, oh yeah. <laughs> so that was the route that I uh, I pursued, and uh, uh, not knowing much about the military at all, I uh, I uh, had to learn a lot of. Uh, things rather quickly. But uh, I entered basic training, went to flight training, as a, and became a warrant officer candidate. And uh, for some reason, I just sort of adapted well to it. I, the fl flight was pretty easy to me. The academics were easy. And along as about uh, time to graduate, we were, uh, uh, it was appeared I was going to be one of the higher level graduates in the class. Uh, and I got offered an opportunity to volunteer for some additional service. And uh, we could you could become a gunship pilot, and the Huey Cobras were brand new, and you could go to Chinooks and fly heavy lifts and other kinds of aircraft. And the last thing on the list was uh, to be a medevac. And we didn't call it dust off in the States just then. And I thought, God, that's kind of what I'm cut out to be. So I decided I'd sign up, and sure enough, was accepted into that, uh, into that family. So once in Vietnam, uh, we didn't have a great amount of training with our units. We had none, in fact, because <laughs> uh, we were filling somebody's seat who'd just gone home, uh, the units that had been there for quite some time. So our learning curve was uh, pretty steep. Uh, you know, if something happened to the guy in the other seat, I'm not sure I could have found the hospital, you know, at the uh, very first days there. But, but we, did, we did have to, uh, uh, to, to learn uh, a lot and a lot fast. I felt fairly skilled at flying the aircraft, but I didn't know anything about how to make low-level approaches into hot landing zones, how to avoid the uh, enemy situations, how to use the radios, where to take the patients once we picked them up, et cetera. So there's an awful lot of learning. And then I really learned how to, wanted to learn how to be a good aircraft commander, someone who was, you know, although I might have been a junior warrant officer, I was in charge of the ship when I was the aircraft commander. And I, frequently had senior people that were my co-pilots. And so it, it, created, it didn't create any problem, but the, lear the learning curve was quite quick. Uh, we in Vietnam had, uh, you know, I guess maybe at the most, maybe 100 to 125 aircraft there doing this mission. Not sure how many we evacuated. I'm sure there's some records someplace, but uh, looked at some reports. We may have moved maybe 800 to a million patients, and that's not all picking up out of a field because 
many of these patients were evacuated three or four times to a, to a hospital uh, to get their resuscitation completed and then to a more definitive care. And then ultimately, many of them were, were shipped out of the country to go to either Japan or some of them back to the States. Our goal was, uh, was, was to treat them quickly, get them resuscitated, and then make determinations that we could return the maximum number of the duty forward. Because we're, it, it's so good as a commander to have people return to duty that are familiar with your organization and have experience in combat. But, uh, so we did, we did a really, really good job of that. But uh, a lot of the patients that, that create a lot of numbers were actually patients that were evacuated from a hospital, possibly, possibly to a facility where they were flown out by the Air Force, you know, into Japan or someplace else. All counted for the statistics. And not every, not every mission was, an, was a, was a uh, uh, hostile fire mission. They were frequently, uh, our ground commanders uh, did a great job in securing landings for us wherever possible. We also had support from a lot of gunships, uh, Cobras and uh, C model UEs that were, were uh, fixed with uh, a lot of a lot of weaponry. So, so we had uh, we had quite a uh, uh, level of support. But uh, when the uh, bullets are flying, it is rather a uh, 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 thrill a minute situation and uh, what have you. We we did also fly. Uh, in fact, I think possibly Kelly or in that same era really started flying at night. No one else flew at night in the, in the Vietnam. But uh, we started, start, we probably flew as many night missions as day missions. It became a uh, real routine for us. We landed uh, strobe lights. We've landed to Zippo lighters being held out. We've uh, used just about anything possible out there to, uh, to find the locations and, and what have you. Uh, training, uh, I didn't have a lot of training other than learn how to fly an aircraft. I, I went to uh, a school of about uh, six weeks, I think, just called essential medical training for the pilots. And it wasn't that we could do the hands-on training, but uh, how to help our medics in, uh, in keeping them calm and organized so they can do the right uh, life-saving things for these, uh, for these patients. So, uh, so that, uh, that part took some effort. Uh, I didn't feel, uh, uh, since we were flying mostly just under visual conditions, I didn't feel trained well in instrument flying. Uh, and Gordon, as soon as I'm over there, we're flying in the clouds, and I didn't have uh, maybe all the experience that I needed but uh, to, to be trained well to do that. In fact, post-Vietnam, uh, I, I decided if I was ever going back again, I wanted to be a better instrument pilot, so I scrounged around, got my instrument ticket, and uh, applied immediately to go to the uh, uh, instrument examiner school so I could uh, at least uh, have some, a good chance of flying even when the uh, conditions pertain. So I think that's... Nick, I'd stop now and uh, Thank you. move on to something else one, if you need. One thing, Merle, in 1969, when you were assigned to the 45th Medical Company, I was. It, <laughs> it, it, it and its, its attached <laughs> units evacuated 99,558 patients, flew 39,178 hours, with an average number of 78 hours per pilot per month. And, and, and people will appreciate this, they awarded 17, they earned seven distinguished service crosses, 13 silver stars, one of which was yours. Um, can't read how many distinguished flying crosses, it looks like 82. One soldier's medal, nine bronze stars with V device, um, 57 air medals with V device, 4,347 air medals, and the list goes on. <laughs> All that paperwork that you had to fill out has <laughs> right. come back to haunt you. I didn't think it ever went anywhere. You know? <laughs> yeah, I can tell you what box it's in. <laughs> Finally, the patient gets to a hospital. And from at least the Civil War, our hospitals had the beginnings of trained nurses, the military nurse in the First World War and the Second World War. So when we went to Vietnam, it was natural that that community that couldn't go to war the feminine half of the race, went to war, but in nurses' uniforms. They'd been doing it for over 100 years. One of them joins us tonight. Then Lieutenant, later Major General. She obviously stayed in for a while. Uh, General Barbish, tell us about what it was like to be trained as a nurse uh, for military duty. 
Well, thank you so much. And thanks uh, to the National Archives and the Institute of Medicine for giving me the opportunity to speak for those 7,000 nurses out there that went to Vietnam. Mine is certainly only one story about how this happened and why I went. But I think I represent a lot of us out there that went. Uh, of course, there were no draft for women. And why did we join, I'm often asked. Uh, Walter Cronkite was blasting the casualties on the front of our television the first time TV brought those casualties to us. And as a nurse, I thought that was a higher calling. And I have to say, most of my classmates uh, felt the same way. And we joined the Army. Now, one of the questions I was asked earlier was, were we trained and ready to go? So after nursing school, and I joined during nursing school, uh, we had that nurse's degree, right? So we went into the Army, uh, had six weeks of officer basic course, where not only did we learn about casualties of war, but we had to learn to march and to salute and who was in charge of what. So it was quite an interesting indoctrination into that process of military medicine. We had a couple weeks where we trained at the jungle training camp and learned a little bit about um, what a gunshot wound looks like and the trajectory of a weapon and a bullet and how the entry wound can be very small and the exit wound can be very big. Uh, things that we certainly were never exposed to in nursing school and in my short uh, tour in a military hospital before I went to Vietnam where I saw nothing in the way of casualties from war. So we hit the ground running pretty hard. Uh, 1969, I landed in Benoit, uh, stayed there for a few days while they figured out where they needed those of us that landed at that same time. Two women on the plane with me going over. Um, we too sat there waiting for our orders. We both ended up at the 91st evacuation in July. Flew up to Da Nang on a fixed wing, and uh, one of our helicopters brought us down to Chu Lai, where we were given an opportunity to see what the hospital looked like before being assigned. My first assignment was in the emergency room. Back then, we called it uh, receiving an emergency. And we got a chance to learn very quickly what it was like to have casualties coming in. We got the casualties from our dust off pilots here. They brought them into the emergency department. We ripped off their clothes, cut their clothes off to identify the wounds. We resuscitated them. We started 14 gauge catheters. Now, to put that in perspective, if you ever have an IV in a hospital, the routine is generally about an 18 gauge. A 14 gauge can give you a liter of fluid in four minutes. An 18 gauge takes 10 minutes to get that same fluid in there. Our guys were oftentimes in shock and unresponsive. But once we put those catheters in, two in each arm, sometimes two in each leg, put fluids in there, we called for blood, we gave them low titer O blood and forced fluids as quickly as we could, resuscitated them, and oftentimes they would wake up from this near-death experience. And they'd look up at us and they would say things like, I think I'm in heaven. You must be an angel. <laughs> so it was, to me, again, that higher calling of trying to resuscitate our guys and as much as we could save as many of those uh, guys that were in there. We dealt with mostly Americans, but many Australians, Brits. We also had a lot of Vietnamese that we dealt with. But we could get them from the emergency room into the operating room in 10 minutes. I learned to shave a head with a straight razor, and I would be shaving that head while we were pulling the gurney down to the operating room and get them in there. It was pretty phenomenal. Steep learning curve. We learned from each other. The guy that taught me to put those god-awful big IVs into collapsed veins was my ward master. And it was a pretty phenomenal experience to see 
what we thought was bringing somebody back to life and getting them into an emergency room. Uh, we had to learn to triage so that if we had casualties, we had to identify the ones we could work on and save vice those that might die, or that if we spent too much time on one of the guys out there, that then five other guys would die. So it was quite a challenge as a young 21-year-old nurse to have to look at somebody and say to them, we're going to do what we can to treat you. We would keep them comfortable while we took care of others and hoped that they would still be alive when we were done treating the mass casualties that we had to deal with. It was uh, pretty intense, um, learned a lot, became family. There were, in my hospital alone, uh, 25 lieutenants, which meant that we all had less than a year's experience after school um, jumping into this kind of situation. It's hard to imagine being prepared to do that. It's hard to imagine having enough training to do that. You almost have to have been there to be able to replicate that kind of training. And uh, you carry that with you all your life. Something stuck with you because you didn't take the uniform off. You, you stayed around. Was there a particular experience or anything that still drives you? Absolutely. You know, um, I think the triage drove me and the emergency medicine drove me. I became a nurse anesthetist. I came home, and we were talking about this a little bit earlier. I came home from Vietnam, and the reason I went into the Army was to treat soldiers in war, and the war was over. It was time for me to go home, but I wasn't ready to take off the uniform. I moved to the reserve, thinking that if there was a war as a reservist, I would be deployed and back again into that uh, environment. But the reserve is where we train people to be ready to go, and I ended up with a career in the reserve, growing along the way, looking at emergency medicine, looking at triage, trying to identify what it is that we can transfer from the military arena into the civilian arena. My military experience pushed me into studying bioterrorism and disasters, and I became uh, a leader in the Army before 9-11 trying to help develop the kind of surge capacity that we might need on the civilian side. Military hospitals in Vietnam had 40% of their hospital beds and their capability available for the mass casualties that these guys were bringing us, 40%, sometimes a little less. But we can't do that in civilian medicine, so how do we prepare for the next event, which unfortunately could be here in our own backyard. So I was on a team that helped develop the um, surge capacity protocols that now have been adopted nationwide. We had hospitals and we had something in the nature of civil defense back in the 50s with the threat of war. But as Colonel Hall mentioned, the diet of wounds rate was better than ever. In fact, one report said you had a better chance of surviving in Vietnam than you did in an auto accident in the United States at the height of the war. And the obvious difference was those helicopters. Colonel Snyder, how did the helicopter get from Vietnam back here? Well, I think uh, it, it was proven of the lives that it saved and the suffering it did and uh, that, it, that it was able to, to, to stop. And, and uh, many of us brought those same things back with us to, uh, to work in the, uh, in the private sector. We, uh, we developed a program where we could use military helicopters to support uh, uh, assistance in traffic areas in the states. In fact, I worked with a couple of those, one in California, one in Texas. And it really inspired the civilians to kind of take charge in getting their own uh, act together to do those kinds of things. And they've done that very well now in almost every major city has uh, dedicated ambulances that support them. And, and it, it led to a great amount of training for the, the emergency medicine training people, EMTs, et cetera. We, uh, we, we had no basic other training, just basic medic training for our troops. And they had to learn a lot, a lot of things uh, you know, uh, uh, on the job. And so I think uh, being able to bring that in and, and uh, 
demonstrate that uh, we had that capacity that, that was developed there has uh, been, been very important. I think that it was. The military assistance to traffic and safety was a, a collaborative program between states and localities and the Army. And it, it gave us uh, beginnings of a, an ability to get you from the accident. But it did require that training. And before the war, most ambulances were what's called scoop and run. In small towns, they were run by the guy who had the hearse in the next garage. It's not a particularly inspiring situation. <laughs> um, and the guys who drove them were just casual labor. In a few cities, fire departments had some people. But the level of training and certification was pretty small. Dr. Berger, you came back with a skill to be a corpsman. Did you have experience in the United States as a civilian? Yes, I did. I, uh, I came back uh, to Boston, and I went to work at, <clears throat> at Massachusetts General. Now, in those days, and this kind of piggybacks upon what the, my colleagues to my right here, the general and the colonel said earlier, is that the whole concept of getting patients immediately to care carried through. Now, in Boston, there was no coordination at the time in 1968, okay, between or among the police department, the fire department, and what we called ourselves, okay, ambulance chasers. We rode along in the ambulances and did first aid kinds of, kinds of stuff. But it was, I think, largely because of, of how it was approached in Vietnam that the American communities took these lessons and put them together. And now, I mean, we have grades of EMTs with paramedics at the top and da-da-da. I mean, you don't go into a civil situation without checking with the police department. I mean, they're hooked in, the fire department. That was not the case in 1968. So uh, I have to say that um, we've come a, come a long way in the civilian community, and I'm glad to see that my colleagues over here have something to do with that. You also had the draftee doctors doing their two years or three years and getting out and coming back into civilian practice and saying, why can't I have what I saw over there? There was the beginning of the community we don't have representative tonight, which is the trauma surgeon, who was, in fact, uh, not credentialed. They were just general surgeons. Right. And they recognized that what they were being taught to do was somehow different. And as they came back in the 70s, they began to ask these questions at Ben Taub in Houston and Charity in New Orleans and Newark and other cities. And they slowly built trauma surgery. So that by the 90s, the idea of getting that patient in that golden hour through the helicopter with trained paramedics into an emergency room and into an operating room within that small, narrow window was available almost everywhere. And we've begun to change the impact for all of us when we experience trauma. These are the stories of three communities in Vietnam and some of what came out of that. But this is a conversation. And we've done the talking so far. On each side, there's a microphone. If you've got a question, a brief comment. I, I promise that you know, we're going to get everybody out of here on time, and that means that if you go on too long about a comment, I may have to, to ask you to, to step away. But let's start at least with questions that you may have brought to tonight's discussion. As I say, we have microphones on each side. You make your way there. I'll ask one more. Colonel Hall, when's the book going to appear? <laughs> How will we have this story developed? Um, well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've got about 40,000 pages I've copied out of the archives. That picture you saw, Archivist of the United States, that was, that was not an illegal picture. I was actually trying to take a picture of a document and had my camera misadjusted, so <laughs> please don't revoke my archivist card. Um, um, I've mostly been doing research. Um, I've got a lot of old dust-off pilots who are now my Facebook friends <laughs> asking the same question. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, I, I mentioned the 57th Medical Detachment Air Ambulance being the first unit arriving. It was one of the first medical units. It was also the last medical unit to leave 
and the last dust off unit to leave. They left eight days before the last American combat troops left Vietnam. So my working title is Five Words, A Narrative History of the Army Medical Department in Vietnam. And I want to kind of weave the 57th in and out through it as a, a thread of continuity. And of course, dust off plays a, a role through the whole story. Right now, the big thing I've been working on, because nobody has it, is a medical order of battle and a list of key leaders in all the different units so that I can kind of, and, and a list of who was where when and what units were arrayed on the battlefield when, because uh, frankly, the, 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 you go into the records and there are 15 copies of one document in eight different locations in the archives, and then you got a unit like the 57th, and their records are infinitesimal, even though they were there for 11 years. And so trying to, to bridge the gaps and, and things, it's very challenging. And, and, and then my wife says, I've met the computer too long and I've got to get away from it. <laughs> and why is my niece looking at her saying, really? <laughs> um, anyway, um, I am. And, um, and so oh, I'm working on it. I'm working on it. But this is not a critique. The archives has the records that survived. And in war, Quite frankly, filling out all the forms in triplicate is not the highest commitment, and getting them back to headquarters is not always a simple process. So the records are the records, and it's one of the mm -hmm. interesting challenges that we need these conversations and other people that are seeing this around the country to help us fill the gaps in those records through oral histories, through interviews, through blogs. It is important that we capture the stories. Because everybody has the same story, but everybody has a different story. There's autobiography, and then there's history. And without the autobiographies, we can't make the histories. So we invite you, here and out there. Yes, Amazon's been cleaning up on me. To tell us what happened. Tell us your story, your training, your experience. Whatever happened that was good. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. My name is Li Yang. Thanks for your presentation and your service. But, but I think you know uh, a lot of higher officials in this country, they don't serve the military when they saw that they're supposed to be. So how do you feel at that time then, and how do you feel now? Well, I was nine during the Tet Offensive. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> um, you know, it was different. Um, we were drafted, and it was expected of you. It was expected of every 18-year-old male in this country. When they did away with the draft, um, I start, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. I do believe in national service, whether it's military or Job Corps or whatever you want to call it. I do believe in that. I think that there are people uh, with certain kinds of, of mental challenges that may be exempt. But national service builds that pride. And it's something that, at least through Vietnam, we continued from, you know, from the First World War. And um, this is a real different kind of military right now because we do not have that uh, kind of service that you're referring to that I was subject to. But we also made a national decision to have a volunteer force. That's true. And in this country, we, we get the government we vote for. That's um, right. <laughs> and so we, uh, we have a lot of virtue um, with long service reservists, career officers, who build a set of skills over time so that our military in some ways is more capable. And if you explore the last 15, 16 years of battle care, you'll find that Colonel Hall's record has been broken. The Army today, a professional, all-volunteer, career service, medical support for that Army, has lowered that died-of-wounds rate even further. 
I, 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 well, one thing I'd like to add is, is that today's military, at least in terms of the hospital corps, um, throughout the services, are now more integrated gender-wise than they were uh, in Vietnam. For example, um, both at Khe San and at Dong Ha, which was the closest large uh, mass unit to uh, one of them, close to Khe San, only one time were there women at Dong Ha, and it was because it was a combined operation between Army and Marines, and so they flew a group of nurses to Dong Ha who worked with us males, okay, there, and then as the casualties dropped and that sort of thing, they were flying people out, all right, the nurses left. And that's the only time I saw nurses, in, at least in the Marines. But now you have Navy nurses that are trained uh, to, in some cases, are with Marine units and, and, of course, the Army tradition carries on. And I, I think it's also important to remember, and this is one of the things that's come, come to me as I'm doing my research, is that we're celebrating the 50th, not anniversary, but we're commemorating the 50th, you know, 50th anniversary of the war. The Tet was 50 years ago this year. When Tet was taking place and the Marines were fighting at Khe San and Wei, that was 50 years after the Battle of Belu Woods. So Vietnam is as far behind us today as World War I was behind those Marines that were fighting in Vietnam. And World War I, or excuse me, the Civil War was as far behind those soldiers, sailors, and airmen who were fighting in Vietnam as World War I is, <coughs> excuse me, behind us today. And we need to keep that in mind. So when we look at uh, the way people were thinking and the way tactics, techniques, and procedures were both medically and on the battlefield, and we wonder why were people thinking that way? Why were they doing things the way they did? We're talking 50 years ago, and, and things have changed politically, philosophically, technologically, and we need to keep that in mind. You know, when, 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 I, mean, I was nine during the Tet Offensive. When, when I was you know, 14 and in the Boy Scouts, we had a member, who, one of our adults, who had been in World War I, and I thought he was ancient. <laughs> you know, now I'm sitting here with three people who are in Shit. Vietnam, and they're like 10 years older than I am. Colonel well, Schneider, just you stayed for a career. Right, and we feel ancient. <laughs> yeah, I did. And, and to answer your question about resentment for the politicians that don't serve, you know, I mean, uh, if a lot of them's performance as a politician is indicative of how they've served as service members, I'm not... Sure, we wanted them there anyhow. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, I, uh, I uh, uh, had never planned to come in, never planned to stay in, but it, it, I was incentivized by uh, a lot of things. I, when I finished my tour in Vietnam as a chief warrant officer, I shortly after that was offered a commission in the Army's Medical Service Corps. And thinking I, with the commitment I had for service, I was going back to Vietnam again. I thought, if I take this commission in the Medical Service Corps, if I go and fly, at least I'll be flying dust off. So uh, it incentivized me to take the commission, and lo and behold, I, I never really got around to going to my next tour. About the time I was going to Vietnam again, they were starting to draw down a little bit in Vietnam. They sent me, uh, as I was en route to Vietnam, they sent me to Monterey, California, and that was a nice alternative than going back to Vietnam <laughs> for a second tour. So I so, uh, continued to, just to have a, a carrot out there the whole time, and, and uh, ended up, by the time I blinked, I'd been in for 30 years and had had such a... Uh, uh, good jobs and experiences and, and felt that I contributed a bit as I went along and it just uh, seemed to be a very, very good career for me. Yeah. We have another question. Yeah, I have a uh, probably somewhat of an esoteric question. I think I was directed at uh, Colonel Hall. I've been a uh, volunteer at the Vietnam Veterans Memorial for the Park Service for 25 years. And I hear a lot of kind of urban myths. And I think one of them is the origin of the call sign of dust off now, some of the tour guides will say mm -hmm. it's, it came about because the helicopters kicked up a lot of dust. But um, I did some research that, in my research, shows that the Major Spencer 
said the unit needed a call sign, so they went to the... Yeah, he went to Da Nang. Da Nang, the heads the support activity, the Navy support activity, who at that time controlled the signal operating instructions. And they basically Correct. looked at a list and said, oh, dust off is available. And Colonel, it, or Major Spencer says, I'll take it. Right, is and all the other true? ones look like tiger killer and, yeah. you know, swamp rat and things that just didn't didn't sound appropriate for a medical unit and dust off was there and then they were in the, when the when the SOI was in the when they were due to change at the end of a quarter they were in the middle of a rather large battle and they said we better not change call signs in the middle of the battle because no one's going to know what the medevac unit is is called so they didn't change dust off at that first time and by that point they said well we better, we better just leave it dust off but at, at that point it wasn't really widely known because there were only five helicopters. And if you look at, and it, it's very graphic in the, in the 1964 historical report for the 57th, is that if you look at the number of, of patients evacuated, it's, it's a line like this, starting in January up until July, and then Kelly gets killed, and it drops almost precipitously the number of patients they're evacuating and the number of missions they're flying and it, it drops off very suddenly. And the accounts that you read, um, again, you can, you, can, uh, you can find the article in the places like newspapers.com, um, you know, his, his obituary by, by Peter Arnett, and, and the other stories, uh, Dust Off by Peter Dorland. Kelly flew around work, looking for work at night, and he'd fly over a site, and he'd say, this is old Dust Off, you got any business for me? And he'd, he'd check in with these, you know, advisors out in the Delta. And so he became known as Dust Off. They'd recognize his voice. And so he became known as the man who was Dust Off. And he became linked to that call sign in a way that nobody else was. And when the 82nd Med Detachment came in shortly after he died, um, which was the second medevac unit that came into country, at first they tried to have, a, have their own call sign and everybody just called them dust off. And they said, well, you know, this isn't going to work. And so they said, well, why don't we keep dust off? Dust off is so in integrated into people's minds, again, primarily because of Kelly at that point. It was very shortly after he died. It was like they came in in August. Kelly had died in July. They said, let's just keep it, and we'll keep it dust off. And then the 57th, um, because they all came in at in, now we rotate whole units in and out at the same time. And having been the deputy commander of a hospital that did that, I think there are arguments to be made for, in, in that type of unit, rotating individuals rather than whole units. Um, they rotated the unit in, and then they said, that means everybody's going to rotate at the same time. So they swapped pilots between the 82nd and the 57th. And so the pilots that came from the 57th to the 82nd said, OK, guys let's tell you what Kelly taught us. And they instilled Kelly's um, eth work ethics and, and Kelly's rules, you know, fly the mission, fly it now. You know, no hesitation, just do it. Uh, we, don't, we don't turn away missions to the 82nd. And then as those pilots rotated back to the States, guys like Brady, went to the 54th Medical Detachment um, and brought it back when it came over to Vietnam. And they instilled into the pilots in those new units the same um, ethics and the same, they call it the Kelly mystique. And so you can trace the pilots that served under Kelly and how they rotated back and came back on their second tour in Vietnam and you can trace them, and then the pilots that worked under them, and how they came back, and you can trace it through 30 years. So for example, you know, Pat Brady served under Charles Kelly. Pat Brady came back on his second tour as ops officer, commander of the 54th Medical Detachment, won the Distinguished Service Cross, the Medal of Honor, 54 Air Medals, and then he, uh, recipient of the Medal of Honor, one of his co-pilots that day commanded the 50, 44th Medical Brigade in Desert Storm. 
So that's how you can trace Kelly's, and he was, he was a pilot, obviously. That's how you can trace Kelly's influence for the next 40 years. I'm is that going to be in your book at the origin of dust off so I can kind of show my colleagues, hey, this is the straight skinny? <laughs> uh, you, you can go online, Google right. dust off Dorlan, D-O-R-L-A-N-D. Help me out here, guys. D-O-R-L-A-N-D. Mm -hmm. and, and you'll, you'll find uh, the, the history that was written um, in 1973. It's a good book. Yeah, thank you. The archives, unfortunately, is not 24-7, 365. <laughs> <laughs> and they... Uh, they do have to lock the doors. I would ask you to join me in thanking the archives, the National Library of Medicine, and our four panelists for what's been a delightful evening.